18, I got my personal training certification, and I worked at a Snap Fitness. And I was doing personal training there and all this stuff. But then with school, it got really hard because they require you to, you know, go do consultations and stuff, which is definitely good. You can't go into a personal training client blind without any information. But it was just hard to do all these consultations and set up my schedule and then teach classes as well. So I started to blog just to get information out there. And then people started asking me for programs, which I thought, oh, well, this is cool. I got people from all over the place who's read my information and asking me for help. So I was giving out, you know, just free advice. And then it got to the point where I was so consumed giving out free advice, I'm like, shoot, I'm like, this might be just a, like a stab in the dark, but I'm gonna put a, a price on it. I think it was like $25 or something for a custom workout, nutrition plan, everything, which it seems absurd now, but I was like, I'll put it up there. I'm probably going to take it down in a couple days because obviously no one's going to pay me for this. And then the first couple weeks, nothing. And then I remember the first time someone purchased it. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. I did it all up. And then from that point forward, it's just like never stopped. Just constantly growing and growing. And that's really the only reason I've ever raised the price. Not to, uh, you know, to get rich or anything like that. Just because as I get busier, I still have to do college, still have to do other stuff. That I almost had to raise the price just to keep the amount of clients I had down, which is kind of a, a great thing. But, so anyway, it started out as a blog, then I turned it into a website, and I was just doing it all myself, and I don't really know what I'm doing with website design, but I just wing it. So, now that we have our, our BMR, we can calculate our total calorie requirements going by our activity multipliers. So on the sheet, it kind of gives you a little estimation of what, you know, maybe where you'll fall, uh, extremely active. <coughs> I've had a lot of clients tell me that they're extremely active and they want me to pump their calories up. And th this extremely active person, uh, to get that type of calorie demand is, I mean, you're almost always an athlete, almost always an endurance athlete, or someone who's training really extensively hard. Uh, and then the sedentary, I mean, really, that's if you're just going walking to class and doing basically no physical activity. So if you do exercise and you do some things physical, you're probably gonna be looking at lightly active to very active. So once we come up with our total after our multiplication. So I have a question. Uh, you and Josh are always working out together. Mm -hmm. What would you consider your activity level? You, and you uh, guys are working out what, every day mm -hmm. for what, an hour and a half probably? Um, I normally would, I kind of teeter between moderately active and very active, and that's, and I'd normally work out between, normally around six to seven hours a week. So I'm, right now, I'm, yeah, I'm doing six or seven hours a week, so I'd probably be, like, very active on the low side or moderately active on the high side. Um, but then there's some types of my training where I maybe cut it down to four days a week for an hour, and then I would be on the lower moderately active. So uh, that's what I would consider myself. Josh. Um, the other thing is, if you're combining weight training and cardio, uh, almost always it's just going to create a greater calorie demand. Or if you're doing high intensity cardio, which actually creates an afterburn effect, not necessarily how many calories you burn during training, but it results in how many you burn throughout the day as well. So that normally uh, raises your energy demand as well. So that'd probably put you at one a little bit higher. We good there? All right, so once we got this number, like I've mentioned, we gotta make an adjustment to get to where we wanna go. Uh, once you've estimated your total calorie requirements, I like to do a 10 to 20% adjustment. A lot of times you'll hear, uh, if you wanna lose weight, subtract 500 calories from your you know, your day-to-day -day diet. And why the number 500? It's because one pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So obviously if you take 500 calories per day, you're gonna end up with a 3,500 calorie deficit, which is one pound a week, which is a pretty good, for if you wanna lose fat or lose weight in general, it's a pretty good range. The problem with this is, if you have someone who's extraordinarily bigger, 500 calories might not be a huge uh, deficit for them. Now, if you take someone smaller, like a 100 pound female, you drop 500 calories from their diet, they might only be eating 1,800, that's, I mean, that's a huge deficit. So if you take 10 to 20%, it's gonna even things out and make it a little bit more consistent. 
Another thing with percentages, uh, you can start out on the low side, so take from your, your total and multiply by 10% and subtract that. And then as calories or your, uh, where you're at as far as calories, once that stops making a, your progress, you can always bump it up to 15 or 20% or, or even a little bit higher. So if you want to lose weight, take the calorie requirement we came up with and then multiply by 20%. That'll give you the total calories you're going to subtract from your overall diet. If you want to gain weight, take that same number and just add it to your total. And that'll be what your, your goal is. That's what you're going to be shooting for at the end of every day. Any questions about that? Around how we come up with the numbers? Deal. <clears throat> so tracking your calories. Uh, it, it has a couple benefits to it. Rather than just eating healthy, now, the first is it does allow for more nutritional freedom. So once we have this calorie total, you can stop thinking of things as healthy and non-healthy and start thinking of them as, well, are, am I going to be able to fit it into my daily uh, requirements, your calories and your macronutrient requirements? And I'm not saying that's a uh, free release to eat junk food, but if you know, you're under your calorie requirement, you can fit in a little bit of unhealthy food and uh, still, you know, lose weight if you're in a deficit or still gain a good amount of weight if you're still in your requirements. And what makes this easy now, like I've mentioned, is these phone apps. Because before, you know, we had smartphones and all these websites to track our food, you'd have to do it with a pen and paper, which is a lot more difficult. If you're, you got to, every time you eat, ooh, I had this, this, and this. And then if you're eating out, like on a college campus, it's extremely hard when you're, you go to Willie and grab something, you're like, you know, how do you know what's in this? Now you can really make good estimations with these with these food apps because you can you know type it right in and it's going to have something very similar to what you just ate. So then at the end of the day, you can really have a good estimation of where you're at. And if you're hitting your numbers, you're right on track. Uh, my favorite one is actually Daily Burn. A lot of people haven't heard of it. You might want to write that down. That's, I mean, I really love. This one, uh, My Fitness Pal is really good as a phone app. And uh, uh, what was the other one? Oh, Live Strong is really good. A lot of people love that one, but I don't think it has a phone app. I think it's just the website, Live Strong. So earlier in the presentation, I talked about nutrient density. And really, what we're talking about here is the vitamins, minerals, and fiber content of the food. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, <clears throat> what's most important is hitting your calorie requirements, your macronutrient requirements. But you also have to make sure you hit your micronutrient requirements, which, which are vitamins and minerals. We'll get into that a little bit in more detail later. But the uh, calorie density, like it says up there, is the ratio of calories to the actual weight of the food. So let's say, for instance, a Pop-Tart. A, a Pop-Tart is... Um, Let's, uh, I think one pastry is about 5 grams of fat, 37 or 38 grams of carbs, and around like 2 or 3 grams of protein. So that's what it's made up of. But it doesn't have any fiber. It doesn't have any really micronutrients, maybe a little bit of iron. I don't know. Not just really knowledgeable. Now, I'm not saying you can't have them. As long as you can fit them into your daily macros, I'm saying is you can't have them very often if you're not eating other calorie-dense foods. So if you're not getting your fiber requirements through other carbohydrate sources, it wouldn't be uh, very beneficial. So examples of calorie-dense foods would be lean meats, uh, green leafy vegetables, anything colored really, any fruits or vegetables are going to be really low in calories in comparison by weight and really high in nutrients. And unprocessed grains, so brown rice and quinoa and stuff like that. I'm actually going to remember getting three or four things. 